welcome again. I'm happy that you're here. Uh, this is the second in the series. The series is called Human Journey Across the Ages, Ecology, Culture and the Self. So this second session today, uh, we are focusing on how human beings communicate. And then what is the birth of languages, arts and sciences. So it's a huge topic. I will try to see how I can address some of its salient features. Now I will tell you many stories in today's session. Because human beings have been telling stories for a long time. And many times through stories we understand the human condition and human journey far better than we do, as I believe, in philosophy or through academic work or through intellectual because stories touch us on many, many levels. I will tell you a story about a book that came out 10 years ago. It was called Three Cups of Tea and it was written in, by an American who was, who was a mountain climber and he was climbing mountains in, in, in northern part of Pakistan. And he had done it many times before and he had an accident. And uh, he was with two other people and he, they were rescued by people who were living there at a height of about 13,000 feet, which is almost 4,000 meters. And these people rescued uh, this person and he was looked after for a month. And uh, he was felt such a sense of obligation and gratitude toward these people, he wrote he took, a, uh, he took a vow to these people that one day I'll come back to these mountains and establish a school here. And so in order to do that, and he did that, but he wrote this book called Three Cups of Tea. And then in the beginning of the book he explains what does this title mean, Three Cups of Tea. So he explained that th these people who had never seen a white person before, and who had never seen mountaineer. People in Pakistan don't necessarily go conquering mountains. This is a very Western idea of conquering nature. You know, these people live there and they struggle to live there. And so they said, when these people invite you for a first cup of tea, they invite you, say, please come to our place for a cup of tea. That means that they're expressing interest. They want to say, I wish to be friends with you. And when they say, after the first cup of tea, they invite you for a second cup of tea. That means that they really like you. They would like you to come back again. And they want to make real friends with you. And then what is the third cup of tea? Well, the third cup, if you get invited for the third cup of tea, that means they really, they are now ready to give their life for you. Hmm? Extraordinary. What an extraordinary way of communicating friendship. Hmm? some extraordinary way of communicating, communicating friendship. Now, in every society, for millennia, we have devised ways of expressing how we communicate friendship, or enmity, or distance, or resentment, or hatred, or love, all this complexity of emotions that human beings have. How do we communicate it? So, languages are, of course, a very extraordinary tool for that communication. But as I said, these people invited you. They hardly said a word to the person. They're sitting there. They're just having tea. No conversation. They didn't have the language to in order to share with this person. But they were happy to see him, to see this man. And so this is, became a way of establishing a relationship, a, a kind of communication which sometimes transcends words. Now the second story I want to tell you, this is about the book. The second story is in sets in Paris. Now there is a bookstore in Paris called Shakespeare and Company. Some of you may know, it's very close to the great cathedral, Notre Dame, just about 100 meters from there. And it's a, it's a bookstore that's only in English language. You don't get books in any other language, not in French, not in Italian, not in Spanish, only in English language. And this bookstore has been there for over 70 years. It's run by, it was run by uh, one person called George Whitman. Now some of you may know uh, there is a famous poet of 19th century United States called, called Walt Whitman. 
And so some people wondered if this person is related to them. But what is amazing about this bookstore, that it said starting from 1920s, anybody who has no place to stay, if you're visiting Paris, come and stay in our bookstore. And so any author, anybody, whether they are, they are Hemingway or, or uh, 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 William, uh, uh, not, uh, or other authors from Canada, Ireland, Britain, from other places, they all stayed there. And over the years, six decades, more than 50,000 people stayed there. And so the word was, use your pill these some of the books as your pillows and arrange some of the books because it is always a chaos in that place. And then do whatever you can do in the bookstore. So over the years, 50,000 people stayed in this bookstore. And everybody who became, many of these writers became famous over the years and they always wrote about this bookstore. I myself wrote, I visited this bookstore in 1998. I wasn't staying there, but I visited it. And I wrote a, uh, one of the pieces I wrote in uh, my last book called Angels in a Bookstore. And the, what is special about this bookstore, there are two levels of it. So as you go to the second level, and that's where George Whitman used to serve tea every a Sunday afternoon, and anybody could come have tea. And there are usually 50, 60, 70 people would come for tea, and I also was there for tea one day. And there is, as you go up the staircase, there was a sign. Its sign said, there, is no, there are no strangers in the world. Every, meet everybody as though he is an angel in disguise. There are no strangers in the world. Meet everyone as though he were an angel in disguise. So this is how this bookstore, and I, my, the title of my uh, piece I wrote about it, called Angels in a Bookstore. And so this is a, 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 a story, simple story about life, about people who have experienced this over six or seven decades, 50,000 people. It came to be known as Socialist Utopia, this book, uh, this bookstore. Socialist Utopia. It doesn't happen there anymore. I was visiting there last two months ago and now it is uh, uh, George Whitman has died and the new people have taken over and they change it around. So this, uh, the spirit has gone. But so it was like this. Now there's something very special about us human beings as I mentioned in my last talk. There are three things that, that we share, that we share as all creatures share. We all share, the all organic life has three things that we share with, with each other. First, everything that is living is constantly struggling to find food. Constantly. You look at a dog or a mosquito or an elephant or a tiger, or a, everybody's engaged in finding food. So this was our story as well. So constantly finding food. And second thing, everybody who's living is trying to make sure they do not become food for somebody else. Hmm? So much energy goes into saying, ha, ah, that, that, that creature is stronger than me, is faster than me, more cunning than me, how do I become, make sure I do not become food for him? So a lot of energy goes into it. And third instinct in nature is that everything living is constantly making copies of himself. Mating instinct, constantly. Now all these three things we share with other creatures. However, each one of these things has changed dramatically in the last 10,000 years for human beings. One thing, just, uh, just to place in a historical co context, until about 100 years ago, about 70 to 80 pe percent people in the world were engaged in producing food, human beings, as they still are in some countries like Nepal or like Afghanistan, it used to be like in India or all developing countries, most people were engaged in producing food. We were farmers, we were peasants. Now in the Western world, no more than 5% people are engaged in producing food. And, it, and their number is going down even as I speak. And the only country in the Western world where the number is about 9 or 10% is Greece. Every other country, Canada, United States, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, everywhere the number is 5% or less. So this change has come about dramatically in the last 100 years. So what we, we, are, we produce food, 
But we do not, everybody is not engaged in producing food. In fact, most of us now increasingly in the Western world, in the urbanized societies, we are, in, we are our largest number of source of employment is not even manufacturing, it is service set. What is called service set. That is what most people are engaged in, are employed in. So it's not producing food or it makes us very different from other animals. Very different. There's, there's no animal in the world, on the planet, even the great lion or the tiger, a great lion when it's old or sick cannot tell its baby lion, say, go get me food today, I'm hungry. He has to get it himself. Or if he can't, he dies. Whereas our human societies have so structured now, we have lots of structures that say we take care of the old, sometimes quite well, sometimes, sometimes not so well, but nevertheless each society has structures. How do we take care of different levels of uh, so structures of society? Another thing that is very different with us human beings, very, and a very important part, is that human beings is the, has the longest childhood of all primates. We have the longest childhood. A baby born is truly helpless. He or she has to be taken care of. Needs to be clothed, needs to be fed, needs to be put to sleep, needs to be washed, needs to be you know, taken care of. If it was not, if it was left alone, it will die. So this is not true of other primates. Of course, there is a caring by the mother and the father of the other primates. But our, our in human beings, our childhood lingers on for many years. And, and this is a, a special reason why it lingers on. It's not just physical growth, the growth of the brain, but also many socialization. We are constantly educating the child. And the child is being educated, being taught things. And it's so it's growing socially, psychologically, spiritually. So it's the physical growth and all other kinds of growth go together. This is a very special feature of human beings. The, the, the all of all primates, human beings have the longest childhood. Now, another thing is that our puberty age of puberty is uh, often 13, 14, 15 years of age. That means they, even if, you may dish, wish to have desire for sexual activity, you, do not, you are not capable of that activity. Now, of course, the age is going down, the age of puberty in the world has gone down by three or four years in the last hundred years. Uh, but nevertheless, psycho, uh, na nature has so equipped us that we, can, we are not capable of producing. Now, this is not true of other primates. The, the, the age of produ reproduction in many primates is much lower. So this distinguishes us very, diff very greatly from other animals. Now, other thing, because today we are talking about, about uh, communication, something we have increasingly everywhere, we are using our brains in an entirely different manner than we did 100 years ago. 200 years ago, when the first time human population became 1 billion, First time in 1807, that is the first time human population was estimated to be 1 billion. And now it took another 100 years before it became 2 billion. And then it, now it's over 7 billion. So it's a big changes have come about in the last 200 years. 200 years ago, no more than 10% people could read and write of human population. No more than 10% people were literate. And when the French Revolution occurred in 1789, 80% people in France could not sign their name. They still had all the passion for the revolution and all the things that happened, but literacy was so low. Today, more than 82% more than people have literacy. Even though our number has increased so much, they're over 7 billion, even though they're still struggling in some societies, saying the girls have not been given equal chances for education and so on. But everywhere in the world, whether it is parts of Africa or Central America or other parts of Asia, everywhere there's a great thrust saying education should become essential, literacy. And then what, then what should in literacy include? Should it be just reading and writing and arithmetic? And what else should? I mean, of course, we debate endlessly what should be included in education. But nevertheless, literacy has become an essential hallmark of civilization. 
and there is no society which can say we are, can, we are modern or we are civilized or we would like to be considered civilized or, or modern society unless there is a great deal of emphasis on education, on literacy. So increase, literally more than 82% people in the world now have considered literate. And that's a huge difference what it was 200 years ago. So that means increasingly how we use our brain has changed. You know, we are not using our hands the way our, our uh, people did 100 years ago. And we are not uh, using uh, you know, whole other processes. So what it, has it done? What has it done? These are interesting changes have come about. Our life span has increased dramatically. Now everywhere in the world, people are living almost double the age what they were living 100 years ago. It's quite an amazing thing. In, in Canada, 1901 census, the average lifespan in Canada was 38 years. That's only 100 years ago. And now it's over 80 years. And everybody, it said in the Western world, anybody who was born in the 21st century, in the last 10, 12 years, he or she will live for the whole century. remarkable changes. So all this it has a great deal to do how we relate to each other, how we communicate with each other because communication is essentially relationship. A relationship. How do we communicate? In the, for a long time what again what distinguishes, uh, distinguishes us greatly from other animals, all animals who are closest to us in, uh, biologically, ch ch uh, chimpanzees, monkeys, apes, they are still moving small bands. You never see a, more, a band of more than 50. So they move in small bands. They are, you know, a father, mother, uh, uh, daughters. Uh, so very small, all blood related. Now we were like this 15, 20, 30, 40,000 years ago. But increasingly our number became larger and larger. From 50 we became 2,000, from 2,000 became 50,000, from 50,000 we became 1 million. So we are increasingly relating to people who have nothing to do with our blood. They are not blood relations. And yet, and yet increasingly we are being told how to relate to these people who, have, who have, may have similar language with us and have uh, uh, sometimes share the same religion, same ethnicity, same color, same culture, but they are not blood relationships. Now this is not true of other animals. Mm? So it's a very big shift from small bands of 20, 30 to now, you know, we live in a global world. We are now saying how do we relate to 7 billion people? How do we say I move to, I visit France or Italy or Switzerland here and there? How do I behave? How do I, I conduct myself with people who are strangers? So that's why I feel this lovely quotation from Shakespeare and company in Paris saying, there are no strangers in the world. And treat everyone as though he were an angel in disguise. Oh, it's amazing. No, I, have, I can't imagine any ape saying this to another ape. There are no strangers in the world. So we are, our notion of who the other is and how do we relate to the other has, has, uh, has placed a lot of new, uh, new emphasis on, on communication. How do we communicate? How do we share? Because ultimately communication is sharing. Sharing, many, sharing emotions, sharing ideas, sharing goods, sharing services, uh, sharing uh, uh, romance, sharing uh, sometimes politics, ideas. So a whole lot of sharing is part of communication. Now, let me um, tell you a little story that uh, people uh, suddenly feel that the world is, is widening. I was here in India on a sh short visit uh, in 1980 with a group of students from Canada. We were in the city of Kurukshetra in the state of Haryana, not too far from Delhi. And there was a big religious gathering there, probably some kind of a uh, kumbha mela of some sort. So there were at least a million people. In India, there are always a million people. There is a people everywhere, you know, a huge number of people. And I was here with 22 students from Canada. And they were all 
they were, none of them, they were all white students at that time. There were not uh, many people from other parts of the world in Canada. So they were all white students and there was one student who was blonde. And he was, had blonde hair, blonde uh, beard, he had a blonde beard and he had blue eyes. And he stood out in this crowd and everybody was looking at him in, in this crowd of so many people, in Indian people. And there is, uh, and I was talking to them, I'm tell, sharing with them that of course you're strangers here. People are curious, what, what do you look like? Who are you? What are you? Hmm? And then as, as I was telling them, there's one woman uh, uh, from the village, she saw me talking to them. Obviously she could see I'm an Indian. Uh, I, I didn't have gray beard at that time. I was a much younger, handsome man. And so, uh, and so this uh, woman comes close to me and says, says to me in Hindi, he says, son, which, which district is this boy from? So I said to her, no, he's not an Indian, he's from another land. Made no sense to her. Absolutely no sense to her. And so she's watching, she's constantly looking at him and watching me and I'm talking to them. And then she says, and it's called, she, this woman, she must be in her 60s, 70s, you know, every woman, when you're 35, every woman looks old after the age of 45. And so she said to me, son, tell me, how come he does not speak our language? So I said to her, well, he's from another country. There are many countries in the world. There are many languages in the world. So he speaks another language. It made no sense to her, absolutely no sense. And she's gawking at him. And then she comes very close to me, as within a few, three inches of my ear. And now she's sharing a secret. And she says, son, tell me, how come our mothers don't produce kids like this? <laughs> you see, I know one could give a little lesson in genetics, but it was really fascinating. And this is not too far, this is 1980. Yeah? This is only 35 years ago. Hmm? And here, People really, truly had very little idea. For many people, the world has, has expanded. And, uh, and uh, we, we forget. And uh, sometimes we become impatient and we, come, we treat other people uh, unkindly. Because really, for many, the world has not expanded. And still struggling to expand. Now, today is a, uh, a talk partly about languages. So I'm going to talk... How many languages are there in the world? Every human being, doesn't matter where he or she is born, whether in Australia or Papua New Guinea or in Croatia or anywhere else in the world, that the very definition of being human is that she or he has a language. This is rem remarkable. This is remarkable. That every human being has a language. And language is not just a heap of words. It is structured. It is a great architecture. Like each language is an architecture. Extraordinary architecture. And, and they say now increasingly those linguists who specialize in this, the language of a Stone Age person is as elegant, as structured as the language of the most sophisticated intellectual. Amazing. Hmm? This is a new discovery that every human being in the world has language and these languages are, has very uh, intricate structure. And the structure is, has to do with noun and pronoun and verb and adjective and adverb and, and then how these words are arranged. They are not arranged in the same way in each language. Uh, I, I, since here uh, so many people speak more than one language, uh, you, you can uh, understand it immediately. We say in, in Canada, we say if you speak three languages, you are trilingual. And if you speak two languages, you are bilingual. And if you speak only one, you are English. 
Uh, so, so, but really, uh, very many people now in the world speaking more than one language, fortunately. But really, the, uh, this is a the, we have the we have been given by nature this gift. This is a gift come 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 to us from nature. That's why many people say language is an instinct. Hmm? It is though it is we are we have been so designed for it by nature that it is an instinct. So we say every human being has the instinct, has the gift of language. Now what language you will use, what language you will use, well depends what is spoken to you. Hmm? That's, that's quite remarkable. So it's not the gift is there, but how that gift expresses itself, that's where culture comes in. That's where family comes in. That's where the others come into the picture. And if they speak, as many people do in certain places, small places like Denmark, Switzerland, more than one language, so and children learn two, three languages so quickly, because that's what everybody is speaking. And that's why we have, uh, last year, we had 20, uh, 27,000 refugees coming from Syria into Canada. And many of them didn't speak, the children didn't speak English, uh, but they said within six months in the school, they were speaking as good English as everybody else. It's remarkable. Hmm? Because they felt this is the school, everybody's speaking, and you pick it up. So, what language? Everybody, every human being has the gift for language. But which language we use, which we speak at the childhood, the, we say that is what is spoken to us. But, and that what is spoken to us, who speaks us to first? Is the mother, the father, the mother, the siblings. So, we call it the mother tongue. So we say, what is your mother tongue? Literally, it's what a great word, extraordinary word, as though mother's tongue has been grafted onto us. Hmm? They say, mother, what's your mother tongue? And so some people can say, I have more than one two mother tongue. We have speak this, and my mother speaks this, papa speaks this, and then in school I speak this, and so two or three languages. But this is a remarkable, that this is a great discovery of the 20th century, that every human being has a language. And, and so it takes away some of the arrogance that some people express, that only Europeans have language, the other people don't have language. Hmm? This, is the, this is the arrogance of the very worst kind. And then, what, how many languages are there in the world? Well, they, now it's estimated, the people who study languages, they say more than 67,000, 6,700 languages in the world. Of which more, the more, more than 2,000 are spoken only by 1,000 people or so. So it's a, it's a kind of research not easy to conduct. You say, who are these people speaking thousand lang only uh, language which is spoken only by thousand people? And then why are there so many languages? Now, some of you are here from the United States. The United States is a big country, 335 million people. But it is a country where there's only one language. And they're sometimes introducing Spanish, but many people are resisting it, southern part of the country in Texas, or in uh, parts of California or New Mexico, but really for all intents and purposes, it's only one language. And sometimes even there's not as much, as much uh, distance in accent in the United States. I have traveled quite extensively in different parts of the United States, and I feel I can understand. I'm not lost. Whereas I go to England, where the language is English, you just step out of London and you can't understand a word what they're saying. There are so many more dialects and accents in England, even though it's a country one-sixth the size of USA, and this area is one-fiftieth the size of USA, some small country, but extraordinary number of dialects and accents. And so much so, George Bernard Shaw, the great playwright in 1920s, he used to boast that he says, you just say one sentence, and I can tell you what street you come from. So it's so, then why, people say, why is it that people have so many different languages? The country, the people, places, when people don't share with each other, you have your own language. Now it might surprise you when I tell you, the country which is one of the smallest countries in the world, and that's Papua New Guinea, near Australia. Uh, it was a German colony until the First World War, then it became a part of almost a uh, uh, protected state of Australia. And it's a Papua New Guinea has a population of about six and a half million. And it has over 830 languages. Amazing. 
Okay? You say, why is it so? Such a range of languages. Well, when people don't communicate with each other, they're isolated. They have their own language. The moment you start sharing, you know, the, your one language begins to disappear or something dominate or some new language emerges. And the people say, ah, because you have to, in order to have something common, you've got to have something, a common language. That's why the United States, such a huge country, both in area and in population, having one language. Hmm? And a country like Papua New Guinea, with only five and, five and a half million people, which would be you know size of any city in many countries, it has 830 languages. Because really, it is so isolated. And it is said, before the Europeans came to Canada, about 350 years ago, Canada, the native Indian, native uh, Indian people or uh, indigenous populations, now we call them First Nations, people of First Nations. They had over 75 languages. Hmm? 75 languages. Because really each time there is a there is an isolation, a cut off from a mount by a mountain, by a lake, by a big river, or by a valley, and you just uh, literally inbreeding. And that's what you are. That's what you speak. That's all. and not only you have only one language, you have also same accent. People say, why? How do people get accent? Why do have people from Glasgow have an accent of a Glasgow accent, and people from Edinburgh, which is not so far away in Scotland, they have a different accent? Why is it? Why does it happen? And then people who go to university, Cambridge University, they get a Oxford accent or a Cambridge accent. Or Oxford. Well, many times, it is also a, a, a language is also a, a, an indication of social status. People like to speak in a certain way because they feel I belong to a special status, and therefore this is the, my way of establishing myself. That who I am. Now, one of my uh, uh, one of my embar moments of embarrassment for me because I have many English friends in Canada. And, right, and if I, my moment of embarrassment, when I introduce an Englishman to another Englishman, they both, neither of them speak to each other. They see, remain silent. Why? They want to see the other person's accent first, before they open their own mouth. So that they can place what social status he is at, before they can establish relation. So very interesting. Now it's changing, it's a breaking down, mind you. But it was a very fascinating to see how people want to see, where are you at? How, you know, just like people want to say how much wealth you have, how much salary you're getting, how much, what, et cetera, et cetera. This is a way of establishing social status to say, before I open my mouth and tell who I am, I want to know where you are at. And it can be quite embarrassing, but this is how people establish social, uh, the, uh, the importance of language. Now, language has, is not just a means of communication, which it is, you know, which of course it is. It is also, it is also a, a social and political power. There are more fights have been going on in the last 70, 80 years over language than perhaps on anything else. Uh, we in Canada have two languages. French, these are official languages, French and English. And the French is only spoken in one part of the country, largely in the province of Quebec. And a few years ago, they had a, a French language dictatorship. Even the signs of uh, any store, if they're English signs, it says Mama's Pizza. No, it has, can't be just Mama's Pizza, it has been French. And there was a very famous store called Eaton's, Eaton's apostrophe S. So now that is not a French word, it, it, can't, it has to change. And so there was an extraordinary pressure to say it has to be only in French, that this is the only way we'll preserve our identity. And now we, have, uh, we are sitting here in Tamil Nadu. The Tamil Nadu had a, a huge rights in the 60s about language. So that there was an attempt to say, well, English will no longer be one of the official languages of India. You see, India, when it became independent in 1947, so English was kept as an official language of the country, one of the official languages. And then Nehru, who was the first prime minister, promised they will keep it only for 10 years. Then we'll slowly bring Hindi as the official language. And, when, and then uh, 1957 came, they were trying to make Hindi and the rights in many parts of the country. We said, no way. We would rather have English than Hindi as a, as a uh, language because they saw that Hindi is the language from the north, from UP, from Rajasthan, from Haryana, from Madhya Pradesh. 
and so on. And so if this is the only official language of the country that will lose out uh, in power, in political power, in social power. So th you see this uh, everywhere. You see this, uh, uh, you see this in uh, Belgium, you see this in, in Switzerland, uh, and you see this in many countries in South America as well. So the idea, the language has, is the expression, is our expression and, uh, uh, of each person, uh, how we express our emotions, uh, our secrets, but it also is an expression of power. So languages are, um, as I said, now there are about estimated about 60, 107 language, 60, 700 languages in the world, and some are spoken, uh, but the, the huge pressures in the world that some languages will disappear. It is estimated that in the next 50 years, that over 90% languages will disappear. Some people, linguists who, who you know, study these things, obviously they feel that this is a loss of culture because language is a career of cultures. They carry cultures. Increasingly, many societies where there are people coming from outside, like in the United States, uh, like in Canada, like in many parts of Europe, people say, how can we make sure that our children do not forget Tamil or Punjabi or Bengali or, or uh, Chinese or Spanish when they come here? So how do we make sure that because they feel this, our culture is so much related to it. If they forget language, they'll forget culture. And once they forget culture, they then don't know, They're, they forget their roots. They say, you, you don't have roots, uh, your cultural roots are gone. So many times there are great attempts being made in some societies, say how do we preserve culture and language. I, I must uh, I say with great pride that in Toronto, uh, which is one probably the most multicultural city in the world, where 60% people were not born in Canada, in the city of Toronto. They, we teach more than 130 languages in the schools. Anytime any group of five students want to learn a language, they will provide a teacher for you. And it's free of charge, it doesn't cost you. And it's always done after the school hours. So if the school finishes at 3.30, they say the class will start at four o'clock, from four to five. And so this is the many students learning Tamil and Punjabi and, uh, and Chinese and Spanish and so on and so on. So this is one way in a multicultural society how, because they, everybody realizes that language is so integral to the idea of who we are, our sense of being, um, our, who, uh, our sense of identity and, uh, and political power and social power. And now the language is not created by a mathematician. Language is not created by one person or a group of people. Uh, we sometimes forget. There are some languages we are creating, and we are creating a whole digital language uh, in, for computers. Now that's created by mathematicians, and it can be studied only by machines. We, we take a little thing, we can't just look at it and say, what does it say? No, it has to be a special way of reading it. But this, now that's created by machines. But languages are, have evolved. They have evolved dramatically. When we look at the English language, English language was considered about 1500 years ago as the language of the primitive people. Eh? These are language of the un uneducated, you know, the, the, the primitive people. And for 300 years in England, many people don't know this, for 300 years in England from about 14, uh, about, until about 1400, English was not the official language of England. It was French. And anybody of the upper classes, they refused to speak English. They felt it is only for the peasants, only for the lower classes. So you have a, a huge change that have come. And now, of course, English has become the most global language, global language in, in the world. Uh, but languages evolve. New words come in, new expressions come in. But something has happened, uh, we uh, uh, need to be aware of. The language uh, become, has been become more and more uh, uh, codified. And as literacy grows, people say, this is the only way to speak. This is the only way to spell. Because earlier, if you look at the spellings of the word school, or teacher, or sky, it will be 10 different ways of spelling these things. Everybody says, uh, writes it the way they want to write. Uh, school could be S-K-U-L-L-E. Uh, so when you begin, you start going to school, the teacher says, yeah, this is the only way to spell it. And if you don't spell it, you, I'm going to fail you. I'm going to punish you. 
So, you have a standard going to the whole raise, rise in literacy has given to standardization in which way some spellings are to be, in which way a sentence to be structured properly, uh, in which way it's correct. And, and then if you don't say it quite this way, you'll be punished. That's not right. And then how are you going to speak it? Now, it's very interesting how in the whole process of communication, in the history of communication in the last uh, 60, 70 years, when BBC was started as broadcasting, now it's a very Im important institution, England, the BBC radio. It started first time in 1920s. And then they said there is BBC English. How do you speak? So people were specially trained to speak in a certain way on BBC radio. And said, so this is the way to pronounce, this is the way to say it. And certain words were not permitted to be said. You know, now of course there's a whole range of words which are spoken and written in the magazine, in the, in the media. But f f earlier on, there were a lot of words, a lot of phrases, they were considered obscene or not proper, not acceptable. But not only that, how you speak, say it. So we have BBC English. And then you have Queen's English. You had Cambridge English. You had Oxford English. So there is a whole very wonderful book called Story of English. It's 13 hour long films were made called Story of English, in which they how English has spread many parts of the world and how it is spoken and why it is spoken in this way. So the moment you standardize something, you standardize some standard way of speaking, reading, spelling, then of course it creates a new kind of uniformity. But this was not always so. As I said, really, this is true of all languages, that at what stage you became standardized. Now, English, BBC television, you see, if you look at BBC television programs, there are so many people who are reading news there. There could be Indian, could be Chinese origin, could be a white person, could be a black person, could be a whole range. And even though they have a certain way of speaking, but it's a, a range has become so much wider, which is not true earlier of BBC English. So, how we cultivate accents, how do we use words, how do we spell them uh, in different parts. So, th there is a certain degree of uniformity that has come about. And uniformity in the sense so that we can understand each other uh, without, you know, always perking our ears and say, what did he say? What does it mean? This is true indeed, a lot of people in England, uh, educated people, uh, there are so many dialects. They say you step out of a big city like Manchester or, or Glasgow and just a few kilometers and you find that you can't understand. Hmm? I was, uh, I was on a, uh, with a group of English people a few uh, a year ago or so on a cruise and there were 12 people who were eating dinner together and they were all, 11 of them were English, I'm the only person who's not English and I, a day or two later I said to them, I enjoy being with you. I mean they were wonderful conversationalists, good fun. But I said to them, I don't, half the time, I don't understand what you're saying. And he's, the one guy said, don't worry, he says, we don't understand each other either. Uh, so that's what we just go along. <clears throat> so it is very interesting, the whole origin of accents and dialects and languages and the uniformity of spellings and the uniformity of how you say something. All this has evolved. It's not done by a mathematician. It's not done by a politician. It is it's the people's expression, how, how you do it. Now, there are many people who influence the language more than others do. A comedian plays with words. As we become more and more literate, our humor has changed. Our humor is mostly to do with words. Earlier people, when you see the people, what made people laugh 200 years ago, 300 years ago? It was mostly action. Things happened. You fell down, you did something, you, did, you farted, you did something, then you say, that's funny. But now our humor is mostly to do with words, You're playing with words. And a great comedian plays with words beautifully. He or she has this gift, and some America has produced some wonderful comedians, and the, the, the way they play with words and they enrich the language, marvelous. Same way poets do that. Poets do that. And great novelists do that. So you, you have others who contribute to the language and make it richer. The great, play, the great uh, writer, Shakespeare, contributed more than 2,000 words to English language which did not exist. This is amazing. This is way back in 1600. Here is a man who himself had only grade 10 education. But he was so, I mean, such a genius. And he coined more than 2,000 words in English language and made them as part of the language. 
And now there are, of course, other people have come, other writers and comedians have come. They don't necessarily coin new words, but they certainly coin new phrases and new ways of saying it. So our language is not static. And if some languages become static, then they die. The, one of the great gifts about English languages is more and more languages have come into it and more ideas have come, come into it. And it's a, it's a language constantly in integrating uh, words from everywhere and very rich from that point, of very accepting. Whereas I think French has not been so open to accepting. This, I, I don't speak, I don't want to offend anybody here. But, uh, uh, but certainly English language has been very open to coining new words and new phrases and enriching it. And that's why I think it has become a, a, a global language. Now, the second thing I wish to uh, talk about, that how did the arts evolve in a society? Hmm? Arts, very important. You know, we sometimes uh, don't uh, give enough uh, weight to the idea how, how did paintings come? How did sculptures come? How did a person write a, a, a poem or a piece of music? And how far back does it go? When we begin to study, we see the incredible, pa we see paintings in the caves going back to 38,000, 40,000 years. We don't see this uh, in, the, in the animal kingdom. This is something very special in human beings, that you would make paintings not only on the outside, but in interior, and you wonder how did people do there, and what kind of light you could have to, in order to make it. Just last year, I was in Ajanta and Alora, and if you have not been there, if you are in India, please go. It is the greatest wonder of India. Okay, if you have not been to Ajanta and Lora, absolutely extraordinary wonder of the country. And it was lost for hundreds, hundreds of years. It was not known where. Who, what is it? It was discovered only in 18, rediscovered in 1820s, quite by accident. And when you go there, one thing. I mean, I was there just a year ago, uh, second, third time, and uh, I was amazed to see how deep inside the rock. 30, 40 feet inside, and you go inside and you see a, Buddha, a statue of Buddha, which is 20 feet high, and it's going back to 1800, uh, two seconds, third, fourth century. You say, how could they possibly make it? What kind of light was there to go inside to keep the place lit in order to make it? And then why so deep down? And the, some of the colors, the vivacious the colors, the composition, they're not primitive painting. They're very sophisticated paintings of the life of Buddha and, and, and so on. So it's a, uh, this human urge, this human urge to recreate, to create beauty. I think this is quite extraordinary, our sense of beauty. It's almost, it is, the, it is part of our nature, to look for the beauty and then to recreate it. We become, we walk, anybody who creates something truly walks in the, in the, in the footsteps of the creator. Anybody, truly, whether you're writing a poem or write, making a piece of painting or writing a sculpture, we, when we create something, we are, we are trying to make, we are walking in the footsteps of the creator. We, we take on that same, same urge to create. And when we see some amazing, amazing pieces like this, and they're in every part of the world, and, and sometimes they've been destroyed. You know, you might, some of you might have visited. I was there in 1977 in Afghanistan and I saw this amazing Buddha sculptures. They were some of the greatest wonders ever created by human hands and human imagination. And, uh, and you just wonder how could possibly be created so somebody can look at it from a distance of 30 kilometers and see Buddha 45, 50 feet high. How could it, I mean, the person who's carving it, sitting on top of his nose and head, how could he possibly imagine what would it look like? Yeah, still, it's a great psychological question, how the human perception, how does it work? You're carving here, the nose, the ear, the hair, and it is to be seen by somebody from a distance of 20, 30 kilometers, and then see the total picture. Yeah? Because it's not, right now we can create all kinds of computer model, but that was not possible. This is done in the fifth century, sixth century. And then it took only a few minutes to destroy it. They were blown, as some of you know, by the Taliban. Because they felt this is against the, the Muslim culture or Muslim image. This is foolish. 
but that's how it happened. So you have, we have had extraordinary spirit, uh, the instinct in, in many societies to create beautiful works of art. When we see some great cathedrals, we see some beautiful mosques, we see some, uh, I feel personally that in the name of religion, some extraordinary beautiful architecture has been created. Whatever else you might say, negative things and destructive things about religion, all kinds, but they have also in their name of religion, some absolutely beautiful architecture has been created. And so when you see this sense of beauty, the aesthetics, whether it's a cathedral or a mosque or, or, a, or a, a synagogue or a Hindu temple or a Buddhist temple, it's amazing, amazing. So this sense of art and how it permeates and how far back it goes. Because truly in our, when we are a higher state of any emotion that touches us very deeply, emotion of grief or happiness or confusion or despair, what do we do? We create art. People write poetry. People make a little painting. People sit down and make a little doodle. And sometimes a great artist creates and does something quite extraordinary. But even the most primitive, most ordinary person. There is a line. There is a line by a great um, um, historian of art. Uh, he was originally from Sri Lanka, but he. Uh, wrote extensively about Oriental art, Indian art, and he was a curator at a museum in, in the USA. His name is Ananda Kumaraswamy, hmm? one of the great art historians, Ananda Kumaraswamy. He said something quite remarkable once. He says, an artist is not a special kind of man. Every man is a special kind of artist. Hmm? An artist is not a special kind of man. Every man is a special kind of artist. So sometimes that, that particular instinct in us is killed or destroyed, or is not encouraged or out of fear, we don't express it or out of anxiety, whatever the reasons. But really that instinct is, it is almost a human instinct to express that, that sense of wonder, exploration, grief, joy, uh, confusion, um, journey on our journey, as, as I've said all these lectures here, really this journey on our journey, we see amazing number of things. People have seen, and not just only one kind of thing. So out of this came uh, this idea. Now, in, in the in increasingly, this idea of intelligence, that human intelligence is not only one expression. We have not talked of multiple intelligences. This is a new idea of an educational psychology, that people have multiple intelligences and multiple ways of create, expressing their creativity. So you can have a wonderfully gifted mathematician, but he could be an idiot when it comes to playing tennis. On the other hand, a person can be a wonderful cricket player, but he's no good in, in, in being a politician. So you have, and now they have devised that maybe there are 12, 13, 14 different kinds of intelligence. And in a good school, and a good parent, and a good teacher, it is his responsibility, it is her responsibility to make sure that that particular intelligence is given full expression and full blossom. Multiple intelligence. And, and, and some people may have the gift of sports. So some people may have a gift for music, some people for painting, for some for mathematics, for some for physics. <coughs> So if only one kind is, 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 is valued or is encouraged, then really we are diminished. Our humanity is diminished. Last week I, I said this and I want to say it again. Very important. In every university in the world, we have sciences. We say sciences, department of sciences. We say departments of arts. And we say department of uh, or fields of humanities. Humanity is its humanities, it's not humanity. They say this because the word humanities is a plural. There are many kinds of humanity. It's not a single humanity. So it is how it expresses itself in every, in every expression, in, in every art form or every way. So it is a, we are expressing our humanities, not our humanity alone. This is a, I don't know, I've asked many uh, people who are historians of education, how did this word come about, that we don't say humanity, that we are say, 
uh, it's a department of arts and humanity. No, this is art and humanities. So, extraordinary. So, we have multiplicities and increasingly this idea of multiple intelligence that some people have the gift for music and it should be encouraged. And this is our responsibility as teachers, as parents, as older brothers and so on, that we try first recognize that it is there uh, that in this child or this person and then how do we encourage it uh, rather than diminish it. Increasingly, sadly, I feel our society sometimes is going too far into being, you know, everybody has to be technically oriented yeah? and everybody has to do things, uh, uh, more practical things. Uh, I feel that's sad because really, uh, Arts and all phases, all kinds of arts are crucial to our blossoming, very crucial. Now, I will now, since let's say the birth of science, I just say just a few words because languages, arts, and sciences they are all integrated. And sometimes people think that the rise of science will, will mean that there's no other, nothing else. Science becomes the new talk to explain everything. That's not possible. It is not possible. Just yesterday, I was sitting in one of the cafes uh, uh, in uh, uh, Aroville Bakery. And uh, I was walking there, coming there. I didn't even know there was a restaurant there. And I just went there, ordered a cup of coffee. And there was one person, he said, are you Professor Kumar? I said, yes. He says, oh, I attended your lecture. And then there was two women there. They said, would you join us? Join us? I said, oh, sure. And then our conversation started. Then I said to them, there is no law of nature which says that the three of us will sit here at this point. There's no law. There's no law of physics or chemistry or geology or zoology which says you will, these three people coming from different places will sit at this point at this time. There's nothing that can explain it. It's not a, it is not an insult to science. It is, a, it is a tribute to the great wonder of the universe. It's not, you know, some scientists say, oh, well, there's a probability so much will happen. And they try to explain it away, but this is stupid. Uh, so, but really, there's no law of physics, no law of chemistry, no law of geology, which says you will sit there and she will sit there at this moment. Uh, you, of course, you say, yes, I come here, I will sit and so on. But so many things in nature are happening, in the universe are happening, which I have a, they, they, there is certain times synchronicity things happen because synchronicity is a wonder. We are surprised, we see the unexpectedness and, and we, are, uh, we are thrilled by it. But really the surprise part is that we are like atoms moving in the universe. Sometimes we collide with each other, sometimes we come close to each other, but sometimes things happen unexpectedly. And the science, in many ways, explains many, many, many phenomena, complex phenomena. But increasingly, I, be, I feel that, that so many phenomena le get left out. And they feel that it's just, it's just not worth our attention. I will finish my, uh, my presentation today by telling you a little story, another story. And it's a story that touched me deeply and it affected my life. It happened many years ago. As he, I was a young man of 23. I was 21 when I went to Canada. And this happened to me at the age of 23. And you know, Canada, some of you know the country is a very beautiful country. It has many lakes, many, many, many lakes. It's like millions of lakes, some very absolutely huge like oceans. And so one of the things Canadians did, used to do more than they do now, they go, used to go camping and canoeing, you know, go take canoe and you go canoeing, go, go for uh, hundreds of kilometers and you go, so you can go for a day and then you take the, go to the next island and go and pitch up your tents and you did this and you um, established friendship, you learned about nature, you uh, admired the, the wonders of uh, waters and so on. So I was, I was traveling like this with a group of eight other people uh, uh, who uh, were uh, Canadians, they were there for many years. And so there were nine of us traveling and uh, in three canoes and it was uh, for two days it rained and so we were inside the tent and then third day when we came out the tent I'm feeling quite happy the sun is out and then we can go and uh, continue our trip. 
and I was in one canoe with another person, and this, we are going the canoe, and this, we saw, I saw, had a little turtle sitting on top of a branch of a tree that had fallen in the water. And this tree is just sticking out, and the turtle sitting on top of it. And it looked very happy. It looked very happy. And it looked like if just as we were happy with the sun, she, this turtle too, looked happy. So we very quietly, we moved our canoe near it, near the tree, and then my friend in the, in the canoe, he picked up the turtle from the shell, lifted it up, and he felt very happy that he's lifted it up. And the turtle looked very unhappy, very sad. And then he turned to me, I had a camera in my hand, says, take a picture of me. Now as I was about to take a picture, I had a, a vision. And a vision of 30 seconds, 40 seconds, but it transformed. And the vision was, does this turtle know what is going on? That is the question. Does this turtle know what's going on? Does it know that there is a hand, a human hand, and it belongs to an arm, and this arm belongs to a body called body of man, and this body is being propelled by a thing called brain, and the brain has motivations, some of them can be, can be vicious or dark or light or wonderful or negative. Does it know all this? And my answer came within seconds and no. It couldn't know. Couldn't possibly know. And then I thought, are we human beings like this turtle? We are like this turtle. We see only the last thing, last hand. And we don't know what else is belonging to this thing. And really all our journey, in a way, is trying to find out the mind of the Creator. And when we find that mind, whether we do it through science or we do it through many, many ways, we see a different way of looking at that hand. You know, that hand may not be full of malice, it may be just a, a playfulness. But really, we are, I, sometimes I feel we are like, we are like a little turtle. Our vision is circumscribed. And there are many vis visionaries, great visionaries, like Sri Aurobindo. I mean, we are, since we are here, we need to be aware of it. Or William Blake, or Kabir, or Guru Nanak, or Christ, who really, they, again and again, their, their theme is, yes, we have language, but there are times when we go beyond the language. We say, I can't say anything more. Words don't come. They don't express. So the vision is uh, really, it becomes ineffable. The words, you know, the experience becomes ineffable. And so they, what they allude to is this mind, the greater mind, the greater mind. And that once we have a little glimpse of that great mind, in whatever manner, it is an extraordinary thing. It changes us. It changes our journey. Hmm? It changes our journey. I will share just one more experience, which again stays with me, because it is it's all of us in our journey every day. We need to be aware how these things change us, because that's that's the real philosophy. We make our own philosophy at every moment. I had just arrived in Canada. I was 21. I had never seen a white person. I had never seen a black person from Africa. I never seen a Chinese person. The only people I knew were Punjabis from Punjab. That's where I grew up. And there, this is a week later, I'm sitting in a room, and in, in a rented room in a house which had 20, 30 other people staying in a big, huge building. And I hear music coming from the next door. And I said to my, I, have, I thought, what a beautiful music. And then the music played on, and I found myself deeply moved by it. And a few minutes later, I saw my tears trickling down my eyes. I said, I have never heard such a beautiful music. How is that possible? I was a student of nuclear physics. I was a pretty good student. I knew how the, the moon can do amazing things to the tides on the earth and all the gravitational forces, but I had no idea how certain sound waves can do such amazing things to your, to your being. And so I was overwhelmed by this music. And when it was over, I went to the door next door. I knocked at the door. I said, what music were you playing? He says, don't you know? I said, I've never heard such beautiful music. He says, this is Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. 
I said, who's Beethoven? I had no idea. You see, it already transcended. Say, I was, I had no, I had, was not at all exposed to Western music. I knew nothing about it. Since then, I, I would like to say I know a little bit, but I had no idea at that time. I had never heard who Beethoven was, or what, what his symphony is. But you see, if you open your heart, open your mind, as many people have done over the centuries, over the millennia in every society, then what comes transforms you. Transforms you. Because really, it didn't, I, you don't have to say, oh, well, it's Western music, Eastern music, Chinese music. No, it is music, it's the waves. So I feel increasingly we have language, we have arts, but really the inverse is sending messages to us all the time. We have to learn how to tune ourselves in order to receive those messages. Thank you.